were you getting and did you watch Paphos ICW? And if so, what did you think when you'd see these Randy Savage promos about challenging Tojo and Dundee and Lawler and Jarrett and everyone else to a fight? Oh, we 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 loved it. Me and Bolin both we loved it. And actually, I've I lost a few of those tapes because I had to, I gave them to back in the days before I had two VCRs and couldn't make copies. I gave them to Christine Jarrett because she wanted to take them back because they you know in case they had a lawsuit, <laughs> they wanted the evidence. Um, but when it was on channel 62 in Lexington, I couldn't see it. But if I went to Boland's house up in LaGrange, Kentucky, and we went, we took his battery operated black and white 12 inch TV that he had gotten from Western auto. Uh, when he went in there, he was the 10,000th, he went in to return something for his mother and he ended up being the 10,000th customer and won a battery operated television. First time he'd ever walked in there in his life, fucking Boland, right? (laughs) But we would take it up on his roof. And boy, sometimes it was cold. That's where the cops tried to get us one time because we were so covered up in these jackets and warm-up suits and hats and everything because it was so cold trying to watch wrestling. The cops thought we were trying to break in the building from the roof. And, you know, anyway, <laughs> and, you know, they, they, we, we came down because they're like, come down and on the thing, come down, come down from there. So we went down. What's the matter? Oh, it's, it's you guys. You know? <laughs> what are you doing up there? What do you think we're doing on the roof? We're watching wrestling on TV. But... Uh, <laughs> We couldn't get Channel 62 unless we did that, but when they when they bopped down to Channel 36, the signal strength increased, and I got a better antenna, and I was able to get it. And, and yeah, we watched, and, and that's the first time I saw Randy Savage against uh, uh, Bob Orton Jr., Randy Savage against Leapin' Lanny Poffo. Um, they, they had really high-quality matches and good work in that studio. Their booking was just horrible because I think all of them were on fucking drugs at the time, and it, it <laughs> shit didn't make any sense, and it just looked so outlaw. And they spent so much time talking about Jarrett's guys and challenging Jarrett's guys. You know, they would take out these big ads that they couldn't afford in the Lexington paper. <laughs> uh, Randy Savage challenges three-on-one handicap match. Jerry Lawler, Jerry Jarrett, and Tojo Yamamoto just, you know, bring a ham sandwich against $100,000. Well, even back then when people weren't smart that much, nobody believed that these ragtag band of ragamuffins had $100,000. So it was just automatically garbage. And that's the, the famous... Quote from Sputnik Monroe, Jerry Jarrett was sitting in the locker room one time in Memphis, and they were all talking about these outlaws over there spending all their time challenging Jarrett's top talent instead of worrying about getting their own guys over. And Jerry said, I just don't understand how stupid people think. And Sputnik jumped up and said, well, hell, Jerry, I'll tell you how stupid people think, and then realized what he'd done to himself, right? (laughs) And then sat back down. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, one of the biggest what ifs to me in wrestling is if Randy Savage hadn't gone to Memphis in 83 because Bill Watts had been airing videos of him to bring him into Mid-South. So that entire 84 run, of course, Dundee ended up being the booker. So that may have put the kibosh on that to begin with. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> the, the idea that, you know, if that Memphis deal hadn't gone through, that potentially instead of the Lawler Savage feud, which finally, you know, paid off this thing that had been built up for years – that Savage would have gone to Mid-South. Just imagining him working for Watts is one of the biggest what-ifs for me. That along with, you know, the British Bulldogs going in in 85, which is the other big rumor throughout the years. Yeah, but I, if, if Savage hadn't gone to Memphis and had gone to Mid-South, you probably wouldn't have heard about Randy Savage after that. Um, because he was probably at that time not a person that – I don't know if he would have flourished in Watts' environment. Um, but also – you got to remember at that point, they had spent five years as outlaws. Savage, from the time he took the name Randy Savage, from the time that he was Randy Poffo, when he and Lanny were partners, they had never drawn a dime. He had never been in a main event position in any kind of major territory, drawn any kind of money. Um, and probably would have, would his work would have... Uh, would have put him up there in Mid-South, but I don't know if his personality-wise, if he and Watts would have got along very well. Yeah. Um, but since he did, because what happened was when, when they knew the Poffo, when Angelo Poffo, the father knew that they couldn't stay in business much longer and it was all coming to a close, he called Jerry Jarrett. He was trying to get a place for his boys to go. He knew he was pretty much done in the business, but he was trying to get a place for his sons to work. And, you know, he was putting out feelers and he called Jarrett and he said, you know, can, can we make up and make something out of this? You know, everybody's been wanting it. And Jarrett said, yeah, 
you know, because it'll be business and it'll be money. And when Savage got a chance to work with Lawler and they drew 8,000 people in Lexington and he worked on top in the Mid-South Coliseum and, you know, he, he worked with Lawler and had those matches and plus – Obviously, was managed by Jimmy Hart, who then, when Hart went to New York, made the statement when they were asking, well, what's the talent like? Well, the best wrestler in the world is down there. You know, Randy Savage, you ought to bring him up. Boom. Savage went from, in 1983, he, he was shoplifting steaks on the Kroger, at the Kroger on New Circle Road in Lexington to eat in an apartment with no fucking furniture in it. And in 1985, he was the WWF champion and made 800 grand in one year. Wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that the story about him shoving a steak down his pants is true? Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? They were, he did, I've, I've had girls tell me they were over there. He had barbells and a mattress on the floor in his apartment. That's what he had. Wow. Now, I think this was from one of your tapes, and I don't think, but I don't think Brian had seen it until I showed it to him recently. I don't think we talked about it in the air. There is a Savage and Orton promo from ICW, uh, yeah, yeah, where they imply where Savage implies that they satisfy each other's manly needs. <laughs> um, what I, do you remember about this? I don't know if I ever saw that one. I saw the the, the promos where they they stooged off Tojo Yamamoto's real name and and uh, you know said a bunch of inside shit like that. But I I I never recall that. And I w- I would have to think that they were they were on some supplements of different kind because I don't think that ever <laughs> happened. But they probably were in, in, in entertaining themselves with it and didn't know that it would it would be being talked about thirty years later or thirty five years later. Yeah, and um, I also I have in front of me, uh, I saved a scan that I had found online of one of their uh, charity challenge promo uh, ads to to the uh, Memphis guys. So there is a thirty thousand dollar triple charity challenge. I think it's Savage challenging Lawler, Valiant, Jarrett, and Dundee. If, yeah, if they win, Jar- Lawler, Valiant, Jarrett, and Dundee will receive a total of fifteen thousand dollars. Plus, an additional fifteen thousand dollars will be given to United Cerebral Palsy. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, it's also it's against Garvin, Orton, and Roop. Also, Ronnie Garvin, Bob Orton, and Bob Roop promise to shave their heads in the ring and never wrestle again for the rest of their lives. <laughs> if Lawler, Valiant, and Dundee lose, ICW will pay four thousand dollars consolation prize to the United Cerebral Palsy Fund for their transportation expenses to and from Rupp Arena, plus any hospitalization and/or psychiatric expenses related to the May twentieth humiliation. If Lawler, Valiant, and Jarrett do not show up. They will receive nothing, and United Cerebral Palsy will receive nothing. Nothing. The kids will get nothing. Some people care more about their own health than the health of those afflicted with cerebral palsy. Remember, superheroes, you have nothing to lose but a bucket of yellow paint, a chicken, a diaper, and a baby bottle. Every once in a while, it was a ham sandwich, too. As Adolf (laughs) Rupp said many times, the glory is not in the winning, but in the trying. There you have it. <laughs> and that's why they didn't draw any money, because if they just spent that much money advertising the matches they did have, <laughs> they might. Well, it does have the lineup. It does have the lineup, which uh, it has. We've got a grudge tag team match, Rip Rogers and Bob Orton Jr. against George, George Weingroff, Brian's favorite wrestler, and Ronnie Garvin. Yeah. Special tag team match, Superstar Barrio. Ba- well, it, it's Barrio here, which ba- I believe su- was actually su- su- his real name. Superstar Barry O. It was Bob Orton's brother, Barry Orton. Right, yeah, Barry Orton. No, but I believe Barry is his real name, right? It's not Barry. Well, now you're saying that like that anybody can tell the difference when you're saying it. it's spelled B-E-R-R-Y, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, So Barry O and the Pride of Alabama, Doug Vines, against Bob Roop and Terry Gibbs. If Roop and Gibbs win, Terry Gibbs will get five minutes alone with manager Izzy Slapowitz. Uh, mixed tag team match, The Miser, who of course was Angela Poffo, and Aunt, and Lady Satan, who was <laughs> and a true Holmes. a true life gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the, you know that that that's, yes. that's the rib. Angelo Poffo was the tightest man in wrestling. He he actually to the point where he didn't like to wash his clothes often because whenever the clothes are washed, it breaks down the fibers and makes them wear out more <laughs> often. <laughs> so yeah, the Miser and Lady Satan, who was Cora Combs. Against Rick McCor- Rick McCord Actually, it's and Debbie Debbie Combs. Well, no, because it's against De- it's oh, against Rick McCord right. okay, and right. the and the beautiful Miss Debbie Combs. Gee, I wonder who was uh, dating the promoter's son at this time. Yeah. 
uh, Pistol Pez Wally against the Mighty Yankee, the Black Avenger against Jeff Sword, plus the wedding of Mr. Stephen Cooper to Miss ICW 1980 Dawn Griner. That's a hell of a card. <laughs> it was it was a superstar, and that was at Rupp Arena, right? Yep. Because uh, also that's another thing. They had to uh, rent them Rupp Arena or they would have sued because Jarrett was in there the first Thursday of every month, but – they didn't have to give them a deal on the rent, so they didn't run Rupp Arena very often because it wasn't it wasn't fucking happening. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there was a video. But one time we, they uh, did have a riot. I think when they ran Lexington, most of the time it was at uh, Henry Clay High School, I believe, and they had a riot there because they did a deal. George Weingroff, also his younger brother, was Eric Weingroff, and Eric later on became a referee down in Mid South, and uh, he was a nice kid, but. I can't remember who the heels were, but they were beating the shit out of George, and all of a sudden they go out and they grab this kid who was like 13, 14 years old, and it was Eric, and they threw him in the ring and started beating him up too, apparently thinking that everybody knew that it was the babyface's brother, but they, the, most of the people there thought that they had just gone out and got some fucking kid out of the audience and thrown <laughs> him in the ring, and, and a bunch of people hit the ring trying to save him, and there was a big fucking riot. <laughs> and it, I mean, you know, it was, it was goddamn bad, bad fucking business over there. 